So I'll take off my I'll take off my president hat and put on my introduce the speaker hat. And um, I'll start by saying a word about the Wildlands Conservancy, which you're going to be hearing a lot more about today. And the Wildlands Conservancy is an organization that I encountered six or eight years ago inland from Los Angeles, where we happened across the Whitewater Preserve. <clears throat> so here was this preserve. It had a wonderful chunk of the desert and a desert river and a beautiful um, visitor center built where there used to be a trout farm. And it was run, owned and run by not the Nature Conservancy, but the Wildlands Conservancy. So they were obviously going to be an important organization um, in the world of conservation with big goals and a big budget. They also had a campground with remarkably educated, bold and strong raccoons. But uh, then when back here, um, a few, some years later, I learned about um, the Wildlands Conservancy having a reserve up here. And that was the Eel River Estuary Preserve down on the uh, bottoms of the Eel River. So we did a field trip there. It was mostly agricultural land, but it was supportive of the restoration efforts of the Salt River Project. So I was somewhat primed when I got an out of the blue email from a new steward at the Wildlands Conservancy Preserve north of Trinidad, the Seawood Cape Preserve. It was Jessie Bunkley and she was seeking to engage the community, in particular CNPS. And it soon became clear that Jessie makes things happen. She listens well, she writes well, she organizes well, and she learns fast. And soon we had lined up two field trips, a native plant consultation, and eventually an evening program. Oh, and an article in our Darlingtonia, our newsletter. So our field trips visited the preserve in March and in June. And by June, we had already seen great progress by the preserve staff in tackling the massive growth of Himalaya blackberry and Spanish heath, two of their major invasive species. And the the, my favorite thing that I saw on the preserve was the huge lupin exuberance on the ocean bluffs in June. It was memorable. And uh, in June, we also found that in the wet meadow that's somewhat near the buildings, there were some native coastal prairie species that, that made it look like doing restoration there could be really rewarding. So Jesse is here tonight to tell you about this interesting place and the plans for it and how you can fit in. Thank you. Here's Jesse. Thank you so much, Carol, for that lovely introduction. And thank you everybody for being here this evening. I'm really excited to share with you about Seawood Cape Preserve. Can everybody see my screen okay? Yes. Okay, great. Um, well, I, I really appreciate the opportunity to meet with you this evening and um, share a little bit about the beautiful place where I get to work. Um, tonight, I will be taking you on an exploration of the different plant communities at the preserve as well as our journey to heal them, which Carol did a nice introduction of. So I am one of the preserve stewards. Tim Haywood is the other steward on site. And he took this beautiful photo here and has several more peppered throughout the presentation. Um, so I wanna start first by observing this beautiful image of those lupin that Carol mentioned. And also in the background, we see the sun. So I think it's safe to say that we are all plant enthusiasts and appreciators of plants. And um, one of the most amazing things about plants is their ability to take sunlight and use that in the process of photosynthesis to create sugars. And that's kind of the foundation of just about every terrestrial ecosystem on earth. Uh, so I want to first take a moment just to appreciate how amazing plants are in general. And then we will get started with the presentation. So 
So first, to give you an overview of the talk, I'll give you a little background and context. I'll introduce the different plant communities. We'll discuss some of the invasive species that we're working with. And we'll talk about the restoration efforts that are ongoing. So a little bit of background. The Wildlands Conservancy is a California-based nonprofit. And we have a dual mission, both to preserve the beauty and biodiversity of the earth and to provide programs so that children may know the wonder and joy of nature. And it's really critical that we have both pieces of this mission because it's great to save places and protect them, but only by bringing children and really everybody in the community onto the land can we help people establish a connection with nature. And that's the way that conservation and preservation of these places will persist through time. And the restoration work that I'm talking about today will be work that continues forever. And so having, um, being able to help children make those connections and be instilled with the passion to continue this work is really critical for it to persist. The organization was founded in 1995. And currently there are 21 preserves that encompass 163,000 acres located across California. And so it's wonderful because we are able to preserve a variety of ecosystems. That makes it the largest nonprofit nature system in California, and we are excited to continue growing. We are also a leader in the nonprofit environmental education in the state and we serve about 65,000 youth annually. And critically, all of our programs and access are free. So we want to make sure that there are no barriers for people to be on the landscape and connect with the land. And in particular, we don't want any economic barriers to be in the way. So I wanna talk a moment about stewardship because my role here is a steward and I see it as a multifaceted position. First, it's really imperative to connect with the land. So I've been at the preserve um, since the end of November of last year, and it has been such a delight to get to be on the land every day and to see it really changing and shifting and changes in the plant community with uh, different plants blooming and going to fruit and losing leaves are really great day-to-day -day indicator of seasonal changes. And I feel really fortunate to have had the experience these past nine months of um, really getting to witness firsthand the shifting temporally of um, different ecological activities on the preserve. And we're really lucky on the North Coast to have access to a lot of different natural spaces with park service and community forests and places like um, Seawood Cape and Eel River Estuary. And I know I'm preaching to the choir a little bit, but I, I do hope that this presentation encourages folks to get out and um, be aware of those small changes day to day because it really is a day to day change. Um, across the landscape. The next step is learning about the ecology of a place. And importantly, that starts with learning about who is there. So what plants are there, what animals, what fungi, and then how do all of those relate and interact with one another? By understanding that, we can better identify imbalances in those relationships. And I'll dig into th these in a, a moment, but Basically, if we can understand how things should be functioning, uh, we can better understand when they aren't functioning correctly. And in those instances, we can then work to restore ecosystem functioning and biodiversity. And then finally, it's really important to share the journey with others. So I feel really lucky to be here tonight um, in part sharing my journey with you all. And I'm also very appreciative of um, the North Coast chapter of CNPS for helping me better connect with the land 
and helping me learn about the plant community so I can start to better understand the ecology of this special place. So thank you, North Coast CNPS. As Carol mentioned, um, the chapter has been out on two different field trips to the preserve, one in the spring and one in the summer. And in that process identified 135 plant species, 105 of which are native. And another shout out to reemphasize how great a tool iNaturalist is. Um, this is a phone app. If, if you're not familiar with it, uh, it allows you to take a photograph of something and can help you identify it. Then the community, community at large can confirm that identification making the observation a research grade level, which scientists can then use in their analysis to understand what might be changing about the ecology of a place. And so it's a wonderful way to engage as a citizen scientist and to provide really critical data for people to then work with at a much larger scale than would otherwise be possible. And also, again, an, an acknowledgement that it is California Biodiversity Week. So if you are on iNaturalist, make sure to contribute to those different projects going on in the community. So Seawood Cape Preserve is located in the Yurok Ancestral Territory. And the Yurok people have been living on the landscape here for time immemorial and have been a part of the ecology um, in a very harmonious way. If we take a look at some aerial photographs, we can see that since European colonization of the region, um, there are quite a few impacts to the landscape. And a lot of these we do see results of on the preserve. So here we can see a lot of large scale agriculture um, a lot of the estuary and wetlands around the bay were diked and drained and turned into um, farmland and ranch land. Industrial logging is a large part of our history here and you can see large swaths of the landscape impacted by that practice. Urbanization development. So, most of us are in the region um, living in buildings. We have stores to help facilitate us, um, general infrastructure, and all of that results in a change of the land. One of the main types of infrastructure is roads. And that has a, a roads have a huge impact on the landscape and, and for wildlife uh, can result in the um, disconnection of different habitats. And for plants, it's a, a really important vector venue for invasive species to be introduced to the different parts of the landscape. So if we zoom in a little bit more, we can see that Seawood Cape Preserve is located about midway between Patrick's Point State Park and Trinidad Head. Just to the east of us is Green Diamond land. So you can see some of those plots that have been logged. And if we look just directly around the preserve itself, you can see that we are bordered by Highway 101. The preserve is bisected by Patrick's Point Drive and our Southern border is Seawood Drive. And so those road systems um, have impacts on the landscape from uh, noise pollution, light pollution, direct collisions with wildlife. And again, they are a site where we see a lot of invasive plant species uh, being introduced. So the preserve was purchased in 2018. And currently we have one trail open to the public on the west side, the area west of Patrick's Point Drive. And that is a trail out to Scotty Point. It is a beautiful view, and I highly recommend checking that out if you haven't yet. I do want to offer a note of caution that the trail is not currently very well maintained. 
And there is a section of about 70 feet where the substrate is pea gravel. And so we have a rope up to help people get down that. But if you do come out, I encourage you to wear good footwear and uh, come with a friend. So the east side of the preserve, the ultimate plan is to have probably about a dozen to 30 campsites for hike and bike campers and a small trail system. It will probably take four to five years to get the permitting and infrastructure in place to support that. So it's currently closed to the public, but we do offer guided tours if a group is interested in coming out like CNPS or um, a classroom or anything like that. So if, if you are interested in coming out with a group, please send me an email and I'd be happy to arrange that. I will put my email up at the end of the presentation um, if folks are interested in that. So from this aerial perspective, I'm gonna introduce a couple of plant communities that we'll talk about today. And these just offer some framework for us to um, work from. There's a lot of overlap of species between plant communities and there's a lot of gradation between them. So this is just kind of something with, for us to build off of. We have a lovely spruce fir forest on the property, a nice swath of redwood forest, including some later seral stage uh, individuals. Wet meadow and alder forest are peppered throughout. And then the west side is that coastal bluff ecosystem. So we're gonna start with the spruce fir forest and I'll draw your attention to this photograph on the left here. When I first arrived, I was a little bit overwhelmed by the amount of green on the landscape. And for those of you who are in the interpretive world, um, that concept is referred to as the green blur. And the idea being that it's just so much to take in, it's almost difficult to tell apart the different colors and textures and people are just kind of inundated. So it took me a couple months to get my forest eyes where I could really appreciate all the variation of the plants that I was seeing. And having CNPS out for those field trips was really invaluable to help me build my foundation of, of understanding the plant community. So on this left photograph, you can see we have several beautiful specimens of Sitka spruce and then a grand fir in the middle there. And now I can certainly appreciate how different these individuals or these species are. The Sitka spruce is the kind of duller gray or green and has these sweeping branches. And then the grand fir is this brighter green with the flat sprays. So it helps when you're looking back at a tree to be able to cue into those kind of overall habit characteristics. You'll also notice that there is um, then alder in the foreground and a little bit of um, meadow even before that. So kind of gradating of those different communities. We are lucky that our spruce fir forest for the most part is fairly healthy. There's good spacing between mature individuals and we have a nice kind of layering of um, the canopy midstory and understory. We're also really lucky to have several beautiful snags on the property. And snags are wonderful because they offer a real diversity of habitat for wildlife from being a place for birds to nest or to forage for grubs for and things like uh, for fungus to grow on and eat and be able to disperse their spores from higher up in the canopy. So I really appreciate having that variation and that age structure as well on the landscape. So the three main um, constituents of the spruce forest are grand fir, Sitka spruce and Coast Douglas fir. To tell these apart, um, there are a few little uh, general tips that I have to offer just from my own experience. So with the firs, it's uh, easy to think of all the Fs. So they are flat needles. 
they are friendly, so the needles are blunt at the end. And for grand fur, the needles are differing lengths. So if you um, aren't able to have a uh, foliage in your hand at ground level, you can also use your binoculars to look up and see if there are varying lengths of needles. That's very indicative of it being a grand fur. The spruce is the S's. So think of sharp and square. So if you were to shake hands with the spruce, it's gonna be quite prickly. The needles are also in a three-dimensional pattern around the twig itself. For dug fur, it's a little bit of a combination of both. So they do have that three-dimensional structure around the branch, but the needles are flat and blunt as well. Um, and dug fir, of course, is not a true fir. And a great indicating characteristic for dug fir is the cone. So drawing your eye to this lower right panel, um, the cones have these unique bracts on them, which I've heard described as being little mouse tails with a little tail here and two little legs as if the mouse was jumping down into this cone bract. And that's unique to dug fir. Uh, so if you see one of those, it's a, a great indication that you've identified your species. Sitka spruce has a much more papery cone and the cones are dropped. So if you come across a, a large Sitka spruce tree, you'll notice that the ground is covered with cones probably from several years. And I recently learned on, on the summer CNPS field trip that the grand firs retain their cones in the canopy and seed dispersal happens from up there. So it's rare to find a grand fir cone on the ground. If you do though, it has this very uh, layered characteristic about it. So moving to the mid story, there are a lot of wonderful plants here that offer great forage for wildlife. Um, so we have in the middle salmonberry, thimbleberry, blackberry, um, all often found in bear scats this time of year. So when you're trying to tell the difference between those, these, a friend of mine, Katrina from State Parks, um, gave me a tip for the salmon berry that if you cover this most distal leaflet, you're left behind with two that make it look like a butterfly. The thimbleberry is a simple leaf that's often very velvety. And recently I've seen thimbleberry leaves as large as a dinner plate. So a fair amount of variability in size there. The California blackberry is a native species. I, I will touch on the Himalayan blackberry later in the talk. To identify this native blackberry, it has three leaves and the stem is round and often turns a purpley color. The habit also is also low to the ground. In the middle, we have an example of a hedge nettle, which is a wonderful plant because it seems to like disturbance quite a lot. And so if we're doing restoration work, it's great seeing a plant like this come up because it will be occupying that space and preventing other invasive species from enjoying that disturbed area. This is a plant where if you um, touch the leaves, it has quite a pungent smell to it. Top left, we have cascara or cascara. I've also seen uh, individuals of this on the coastal bluff, and I'll show you a picture of them later. But this plant has some medicinal uses as a laxative. And then the bottom two here, we've got colt's foot and spreading wood fern, which are both great indicators of moist soil. So moving on, this slide is full of photographs from Tim Haywood. Um, and you can tell it is a spring slide. We have a lot of different blooms here. Um, so we're lucky enough to have a, a good diversity of all these different flowers in the springtime, which again provides great forage for different pollinators. There is the Western Bleeding Heart, which is just a wonderful name. We have quite a few candy flowers throughout the spruce fir forest. 
And uh, we were really lucky to find quite a few fetid adder's tongue, both in the spruce fir and the redwood forest. And this plant has really interesting ecology. Um, it is a fly pollinated plant. And that uh, is partly why fetid it is in its name. It does attract flies. And then it's dispersed by ants. And so after the flower has gone to fruit, the stalk kind of turns down and touches the ground and then ants are able to easily access those fruits and disperse them. And I want for a moment, I meant to say this at the beginning, but I wanna just let you know that for these different names I have listed, the if I was able to find the name in Yurok, that is listed first and is underlined. And then we have the English and then the Latin um, scientific name. So on the bottom right here, we have wild cucumber, which is also fairly prevalent in all of the different um, plant communities on the preserve. And I included it because uh, it's, I think sometimes those plants that are more abundant, we might not appreciate as much, but it is still a, a really beautiful flower and plant and uh, an important member of this community. In the middle here, we have the Columbia lily, which was what I chose for our little marquee for the talk. And then of course, red flowering currant, which is um, just gorgeous in the springtime. If I imagine that all of you have enjoyed them, but I, it was my first season for really uh, seeing them on the landscape and it was a treat. So we'll continue our walk now into the redwood forest. On the left photograph here, we have an example of a Sitka spruce next to a coast redwood that has quite a lot of sun on it. And so again, stepping back and looking at the trees from afar, you can see those differences in color and texture and habit. Um, we're fortunate that we do have a fair amount of redwoods on the property. Um, the preserve, the property here was logged and we think it, we're estimating about 70 to 80 years ago that that happened. Uh, we do however still have some late seral individuals. So I'm not sure how those were spared but we're fortunate to have them still present. Um, but given the lifespan of these trees, the restoration of this community will be in progress for hundreds of years till they're able to reach those old growth stages. If you're looking at the foliage of uh, the coast redwood and trying just from the leaves to tell it apart from the other um, trees that we've discussed so far, a really good thing to cue in on is that they are flat needles that are all the same length and pointy. And this is the, the shade foliage that would be closer to the ground and more accessible. So of course the primary constituent for the redwood forest is the crossed redwood tree. And it is the tallest tree in the world. We're so fortunate to be uh, in their midst here on the North Coast. About 95% of old growth redwood forests have been logged. So preserving that last 5% and helping to restore places with uh, coast redwood still standing is really critical for the continuation of this ecosystem. In the understory of the, the coast redwood community, we see huckleberry, both red huckleberry and evergreen huckleberry and Salal. And again, these are off, often also found in the spruce fir forest. And once again, uh, from my more wildlife biased perspective, I see all of these berries and I know that there are a lot of happy birds and mammals out there enjoying them. And the plants, of course, are getting their seeds dispersed in the process. We also have some lovely individuals that are um, more on the forest floor, like the Western star flower. Wood rush, uh, long-tailed ginger. We have carpets of false lily of the valley, which are just stunning. 
And I want to, for a moment, um, draw your eye to the, the ginger and the false lily of the valley because they're both heart-shaped. So at first I was at times getting them confused, but a really great characteristic to tell them apart is their venation. So the false lily of the valley is a monocot and has parallel veins while the wild ginger is a eudicot and has branching veins. And it's a little bit difficult to see, but in the very middle of this um, photograph, you can see that this ginger is in bloom and the flowers of the ginger are just really interesting. They're often underneath the leaves and it's a almost a burnt red coloration. So once I discovered that they're a little bit hidden, I took more time in exploring around them to see if they were in bloom or not. And again, I think that taking time is probably the best thing to do when you're out on a walk. Um, it's so easy to miss small things that really are beautiful and important to understanding the ecosystem. So on the top right here, we have an example of a Western sword fern, uh, really important and prevalent in the redwood forest, but also common in the spruce fir. And I've even seen them on the coastal bluff. Um, so a, a big part of all of the communities here. This bottom image is of a flower from a redwood violet. And in this wood rush photograph, you can see some violets as well. Um, so much smaller, still kind of a heart shape. And then of course the trillium, which is kind of a, a poster child of uh, the understory of the redwood forest. And I learned that they turn from white to this purplish color as they senesce. Um, which is amazing that something so beautiful can continue being beautiful as it, it changes and grows older. So I would like to move now to our wet meadow and alder forests. So we're really lucky on the preserve to have a couple of areas with some ephemeral ponds. This photograph on the left um, was taken in around July. In the winter time, we have water, standing water all the way up to here, so a couple of feet, and that's great habitat for amphibians and water-loving plants. This is uh, the coastal prey wet meadow um, community that Carol was referencing, and um, the story will continue, or will unfold, um, continue the presentation, um, but we're really fortunate to have this area of the preserve. And you can see again that it gradates into the alder forest and then the spruce fir in the background. And to the right, we have a coast redwood. So all of these communities are very proximal to one another. This top right photo is showing what the alder forest looks like in the summertime. The alder is the only uh, deciduous tree on the property. And so that offers some nice variation in terms of um, light availability seasonally for those particular parts of the community. So in the wet meadow and alder forest, of course the red alder is central to the alder forest ecosystem. And the seeds there, Again, wonderful food. This past year we had pine siskins. There was an eruption of pine siskins and they love having the red alder to feed on. Again, California blackberry is a, a big component of these ecosystems or communities. And some really common species like self heal, the red clover, Water parsley is very common in those areas that have um, the ephemeral ponds. The bracken fern is a wonderful species that I am so glad to see springing up as we remove Himalayan blackberry and uh, Spanish heath from the landscape. And then in the middle here, we have that kind of jewel, the, the coast lotus that was discovered in the second field trip that CNPS had on the property. 
um, low to the ground, really brightly colored, and very special that this native plant is back on the landscape. So now we're gonna fly over this line of Douglas fir and look down on the coastal bluff ecosystem. And as you can see, the Pacific Ocean is a really important part of this ecosystem. It tempers the climate. So if it's, it can be 100 degrees inland and on the coast, it can be 65 or 55 degrees. And that sets up this important convective current where inland the hot air rises, creates a vacuum, and the coast, cool coastal air is drawn in and that often brings the marine layer onto the land. And that coastal fog is the primary form of precipitation that the coast redwoods have for the summertime and is a major reason why they're limited in range just along the coastal region. You'll notice that as we go over um, the bluff that all of the plants are much lower to the ground. And that's in part because we have a, a lot more wind um, and intense wind impacting the bluff area. Again, this is a view that you can get from walking the Scotty Point Trail. And I invite you to come and enjoy it. It really is a spectacular perspective of our California coast. Um, just as a reminder, do be cautious when you're on that trail um, that we do want for people to enjoy the beauty that is preserved here. So looking at the coastal bluff, this left image, you can see the trail a little bit in there. Um, so a lot of diversity here. Again, you can see how it, it gradates up into the spruce fir, fir forest along the top of the bluff. And this right photograph has an example of a cascara that is um, exposed to that high intensity wind, as well as the, the salt spray that is inherent with being so close to the ocean. And you'll notice that it's much more, it, its habit is much more squat and full and, and um, just really quite different from those specimens that are found in the forest ecosystem where instead they're being selected to uh, be tall and reach for the light. And they're able to be a little bit more spindly because they don't have as much impact from the wind. So this community is really quite diverse. Starting kind of from the road and working our way in, you can see quite a few red elderberry and uh, blue blossom further from the coast, as well as ocean spray. We have at least one nice example of a wax myrtle along that coastal bluff ecosystem. And the roadways, as well as along the trail, are really covered with uh, wild rose, so the Nootka rose, which makes it quite pleasant in the summer to smell that fragrance um, in the summer heat. Here's another image of a red flowering current. So just really stunning how full of blooms these plants can be in the springtime. And Carol mentioned the lupin bloom. So we're fortunate to have quite a bit of riverbank lupin all along the coast. And May and June were stunning with just waves of purple along the bluff. And then in the bottom image, you can see a Henderson's angelica. So this is one of those white flowering umbels that we see um, across Humboldt and easily distinguished from other white umbels like uh, cow parsnip or uh, poison hemlock from their very distinctive leaves. Coyote brush is a major 
um, constituent of this community. And it is currently in bloom, which is uh, lovely because their blooms are somewhat understated, but they're so numerous. So I, I recommend if, if you go out soon to the, the point or really any of the bluff um, ecosystems in the Trinidad area, checking out the coyote brush. We also have a nice population of coast silk tassel and some uh, twin berries mixed in there. On the rocky point, we have Dudlia and sea plantain, uh, which are really lovely. And I recommend bringing a pair of binoculars to fully appreciate those because they are difficult to get close up, up close to. And then finally on this slide, we have an example of yarrow, which the uh, species name is indicating having many, many fine leaves and um, telling this plant apart from the angelica, it's much smaller, lower to the ground. And again, the leaves are, are radically different from one another. So all of this plant biodiversity lays the groundwork and is foundational then for biodiversity at large. We're fortunate that with the confluence of all these different plant communities, we see a lot of different types of fungus, of animals, birds, mammals, um, lichens, and that foundation of having a diverse plant community is really critical in making sure that, that all the biodiversity of the ecosystem continues to be supported. So here are just a few of the different organisms that we've documented on the property. Of course, our classic banana slug, the Pacific banana slug. Uh, we have California slender salamander, a great diversity of fungi, which I'm eagerly learning about as well. Um, and then some more closely related uh, species like the black bear and gray fox. We have also photographed raccoon, bobcat, black-tailed deer, and fisher, which was really exciting when we were able to confirm that we have them on the property. Once again, snags are so important for a host of different organisms. Here you see a, an osprey with a nest and a snag that's located in one of the river drainages on the preserve. We had a pair fledge two chicks this year. The um, fledglings have just recently taken flight and it's just been a delight to get to watch that next generation be brought into the world and get to hear them <laughs> every day as they're talking to their parents, asking for more and more dinner. And then this bottom left photograph of a bald eagle um, perching in a, one of the Douglas firs that's right along the coast. Uh, we were really excited to see this individual and it is a, apparently eating a common myrrh, which was probably taken from one of the seabird colonies on a nearby sea stack. So all of this biodiversity is interrelated with one another and dependent on one another. And unfortunately, um, here, like most places, we have a fair number of invasive species that disrupt that balance. So a major problem with a lot of these invasive plant species is once they are introduced into a community, they can take over and become a monocrop. So this bottom or the top right photograph of English ivy uh, you can see where we've cut around the trees and, and freed it and it's dried from the trees. But if we didn't address this situation, even the trees would be overcome and fall under the weight of so much ivy. And the problem then is now you've lost all of the native plant diversity. And as a consequence of that, you lose a lot of the diversity of all of the other organisms as well. On the coastal bluff, a big issue is the pampas grass or jubata grass. 
which is very persistent and is often challenging to access. Throughout the east side of the preserve, we have a fair amount of scotch broom, which is in the Fabaceae family. And so it's a nitrogen fixer and it can result in, it can change the chemistry of the soil and that can have further ecological repercussions. It's also very easy to ignite and it acts as a ladder fuel. So I think we're all with the mega fires more and more aware of um, how things burn on the landscape and how our activities have altered the normal fire regimes and the, the normal behavior of fire on the landscape. In this bottom middle photograph, we see a Spanish heath and the wet meadow or coastal prairie area that I um, illustrated before three years ago was entirely Spanish heath. And it's taken a lot of effort to remove that, but it's so rewarding to see things like the coast lotus return and um, see the ecosystem healing and returning to higher levels of biodiversity and proper functioning as a result of all of that hard work. The wild radish is very common, particularly all along the roadsides. And Himalayan blackberry is one that I imagine everybody is fairly familiar with. So to tell the species apart from the California native blackberry, the leaves are in groups of five, not three. And the Himalayan blackberry forms really large, thick canes that are angled. And those canes allow it to kind of climb up and creep up trees and shade out things below it and essentially um, form, again, kind of monocultures of just Himalayan blackberry. On the coastal bluff, we do have sea fig or ice plant competing with the deadlia and the sea plantain for space. Again, that will offer unique challenges in trying to access it on those really rocky, steep uh, slopes. And then we have a lot of other things that are, are common invasives throughout the area and along roadsides. So poison hemlock, cotoneaster, foxglove, bull thistle, which really loves disturbed areas. So we've encountered problems where we might um, you know, eradicate one species like Himalayan blackberry from an area, but in that disturbed site, we have then a flush of bull thistle come up in the fall. And so this process of restoration is very much an iterative and ongoing process. And then there are plants like Crocosmia, which were brought as ornamentals and escaped, and now can be seen along roadways all across Trinidad. So we are putting all of our effort or a lot of our effort right now into restoring these places and removing these invasive species. So we've been really fortunate to partner with the Outward Bound Adventures organization for the last three years. Three years ago, they worked on that Spanish heath project. This year, they worked on the English ivy pulling, which I believe that we pulled out about 10 dump trailer loads full of English ivy from just one of the roadside pullouts. Um, Rebecca, the ranger from the Eel River is seen here standing on a giant pile of pampas grass that she used the tractor to, <laughs> to extricate from areas all along the east side. And it's really difficult to get rid of pampas grass. We ended up green wasting it. And then here we can see her operating the tractor to put some Himalayan blackberry in the dump trailer. So it really, it takes a lot of hands to do this work and it will be work that we do probably for the life of the preserve forever. Uh, but it is really important and rewarding and seeing things like the return of the coast lotus are um, kind of those cherries on top of knowing that we're helping to bring back biodiversity of, of native plants.
and consequently biodiversity at large. So we have ongoing stewardship at Seawood Cape. We will continue to have field trips. So uh, helping us stewards inventory what species are on the preserve so we can best manage them. We will be organizing community stewardship days. Uh, we've kind of been waiting with the Delta variant to have anything in person, but keep an eye on Eco News or North, North Coast Journal. Um, and if you're interested in, in joining a stewardship day, please feel free to send me an email and I can put you on our email list as well. Um, and that those days are gonna be a lot of hard work like we see in places like the state park system and um, Trinidad Coastal Land Trust has stewardship days as does Friends of the Dunes. And we're all just working towards this goal of helping to restore ecosystems. And a big part of that is the challenging physical labor of removing these invasive species. We also will be offering educational opportunities. So we've had one student from HSU out doing some research on this, the property. Um, and we are having a graduate student seminar out for a field trip later this month, but we're hoping to continue connecting with youth and particularly children. Um, so we'll be partnering with different schools in the area. Again, we're kind of easing into this given the situation with COVID, but if you're aware of a classroom or a community group that would benefit from being on the preserve, please send me an email and we will, um, plan a tour to have you out. So with that, just a reminder that the east side of the preserve is only open for organized guided tours right now. So if you are interested, send me an email. But otherwise, the west side is open to the public. Just be prepared for that trail that's a little bit challenging. So the Wildlands Conservancy at large, we do have um, another preserve locally, as Carol mentioned, the Eel River Estuary Preserve. And this preserve is located in the Ferndale area at the mouth of the Eel River. It's 1300 acres. It was acquired in 2008 and we have some fairly extensive restoration work that will be going on down there. It's a wonderful habitat for a huge variety of birds, particularly ducks and geese in the winter time. So to access that preserve, it is by a reservation system. And at the end, I'll put up the contact information for Alex Blessing, who is the manager of all of the North Coast Preserves. And if you're interested in seeing the Eel River, we would love to get you out there. Um, just send him an email and we can coordinate um, getting you access. We're also in the process of trying to acquire a property along the Grand Canyon of the Eel River. It is the Dean Wetter Lone Pine Ranch, and it would be a 30,000 acre piece of land that would include 20 river miles of the Eel River. And this um, preserve would hook in with the Great Red Redwood Trail uh, system that is being developed. And again, all camping and access and education is free. So this would offer an enormous opportunity for the community, for conservation, having that connectivity of a large swath of land. Um, so we're really hoping to finalize our funding and procure this beautiful property. Um, so keep an eye on the Wildlands Conservancy webpage to see how that, that final fundraising effort is going. And if you would like to contribute, um, it's definitely a worthwhile cause. So I want to also acknowledge that we have so many wonderful organizations in the community that are stewarding the land, that are working towards restoring places that are impacted by human activity. Um, that includes the Trinidad Coastal Land Trust, Friends of the Dunes, the National and State Park Systems, and a host of other groups. Um, so I really encourage everybody, if you're interested in um, restoration work. And I imagine that a lot of you are already aware of a lot of these opportunities, but just to reemphasize uh, how fortunate we are to have 
this host of organizations in our community working on this important uh, goal of restoring ecosystems. So there is a community member who developed a website called planethuggers.org. That is a calendar of all the different events going on with these different groups. So it's a nice hub to check out if you want to see what's coming up this weekend or next month. So I want to wrap up by um, mentioning that the Wildlands Conservancy has something called the Behold the Beauty Association, which is uh, essentially a venue for us to appreciate nature. Uh, you're welcome to sign up for the emails that the association puts out. They are quarterly or seasonally, and they're basically updates about what's going on with the different preserves and acquisitions and also articles that help us reflect on uh, the beauty that is around us and that we're trying to save with the Wildlands Conservancy. It also uh, outlines our tenants and principles, which I think is a really great way to better get to know the organization. And uh, our website is listed here, wildlandsconservancy.org. Um, and that's a, a great venue to just get to know more about what's going on, uh, all the different preserves. If you're traveling and you wanna see if you might be able to visit a preserve wherever you're going, um, it's full of resources there. So I encourage you to check that out if you would like more information about the organization. And finally, I'll leave you with our contacts. So again, if you would like to visit the Eel River Estuary Preserve, um, please send Alex Blessing an email and he will arrange uh, for that access. And if you would like to visit the east side of, of Seawood Cape, please send me an email and we can arrange a tour. Or if you have suggestions of community groups or organizations that would be great partners, please feel free to reach out. So with that, I will leave that up in case you would like to write down that information. But thank you all so much for your attention and please let me know if you have any questions. And again, thank you CMPS for having me this evening.